good morning. Uh, this morning, in the Economic and Social Council Chamber, the Secretary General took part in the UN 75th inaugural launch event uh, entitled Youth in the Driving Seat. The Secretary General asked the young people who were present to express their opinions and said he was there to listen, to learn from them. He reiterated the UN is striving to do better respond to their concerns, hopes, and fears. All of that has been placed on the UN webcast, web TV page. Uh, on the coronavirus, uh, the Director General of the World Health Organization, Dr. Tedros, today announced that he will reconvene the International Health Regulation Emergency Committee to advise him on whether the current outbreak constitutes a public health emergency of international concern. He said that while uh, just 1% of the more than 6,000 cases have been recorded to date outside of China, person-to-person -person transmission has been recorded in three countries outside of China. This potential for further global spread is why he has called for the emergency committee to reconvene. Dr. Tedros has just returned to Geneva from China, where, as we told you yesterday, he met President Xi and the ministers of health and foreign affairs. He, it was agreed that WHO will send international experts to China as soon as possible to work with Chinese counterparts on increasing understanding of the outbreak and, and guide political and excuse me, and guide res, global response efforts. For its parts, UNICEF has sent respiratory masks and protective suits for health workers and that shipments have arrived in Shanghai. The agency will be sending more items in the coming days and weeks. UNICEF Executive Director Henrietta Four said that while we may not know enough about the virus impact on children or how many may be affected, we do know that close monitoring and prevention are key. Time is not on our side, she added. The Emergency Relief Coordinator, Mark Lowcock, briefed the Security Council this morning on Syria and said that hostilities have escalated in recent days in the Idlib area, especially around Marat al-Numan, uh, Sarakeb, and western Aleppo. The fighting in these areas appears to be more intense than anything we have seen in the last year, he said. The most alarming reports have come from southern Idlib, he added, where hundreds of airstrikes by the government of Syria and its allies have been concentrated. Meanwhile, non-state armed groups continue to shell Aleppo city, killing or injuring dozens of civilians. Mr. Lowcock said the UN assessment is at least 20,000 people have moved in the last two days. Some 115,000 have left in the past week, and nearly 390,000 have fled in the past two months. It is imperative, Mr. Lowcock added, that all parties agree to an immediate cessation of hostilities in and around the Idlib de-escalation area. Mr. Lowcock added that the humanitarian situation in the Northeast remains difficult, with some 70,000 people still displaced following the military operations we saw in October, an additional 90,000 people living in IDP camps. This afternoon, Hala Matar, the Deputy Special Envoy for Syria, is expected to brief the Council. And the Secretary General Special Representative for Libya, Ghassam Salame, has been invited to brief the African Union High Level Committee on Libya, which is be taking place in the Republic of Congo. The Special Representative understands the impact of the Libyan crisis on African countries, especially in terms of terrorism and migration, and expresses his appreciation to the close relationship with the African Union and its continued support for the United Nations efforts to bring about peace and stability to Libya. And the UN peacekeeping mission in the Central African Republic reports today that the situation in the town of Bria, located in Otkoto Prefecture, is calm but tense. Over the weekend, there were clashes between factions of an armed group, the Front Populaire for the Renaissance de la Centrafrique. The mission has engaged in dialogue facilitation between factions of the group, but as UN peacekeepers continue to patrol the areas to protect civilians and prevent a resumption of the violence. The clash has also led to the displacement of thousands of people. And the, following her visit to the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Michelle Bachelet, the High Commissioner for Human Rights, called on both the country's governments and the international community to, quote, seize the opportunity to lift the country out of its deadly cocktail of conflicts, human rights violations, and chronic socioeconomic problems. The High Commissioner began her visit in the province of Ituri before flying to Kinshasa, where she met with the President and other government officials.
And today, the government of Ethiopia, the United Nations, and our humanitarian partners launched the Humanitarian Response Plan for Ethiopia for 2020. The plan calls for $1 billion to help 7 million people out of the 8.4 million people identified as being in need of humanitarian aid. It is expected that displacement caused by conflict, disease outbreak, rain shortfalls in part of the country, and floods in others will continue to drive humanitarian needs in Ethiopia this year. Currently, Ethiopia is experiencing one of the most severe desert locust invasions, which could lead to loss of livelihood and food insecurity, if not contained soon. And we also launched uh, the Ukraine Humanitarian Response Plan for 2020. The plan seeks $158 million to assist 2 million people. This includes 200,000 internally displaced people, 850,000 people in government-controlled areas, and 910,000 in non-government-controlled areas. The plan includes the provisions of emergency assistance, protection, strengthening of the national capacity in coordination with development actors, and securing access for 3.4 million people in need. Since the start of the conflict in Ukraine, the international community has contributed over $500 million for the humanitarian response, with this support, the UN and other humanitarian organizations have been able to reach over 1 million people each year. This is, however, only half of the targeted population due to lack of funding and limited humanitarian access. And uh, just to flag from UNICEF that today they say they are boosting efforts to fight pneumonia that could avert nearly 9 million child deaths. Child deaths from pneumonia are concentrated in the world's poorest countries and is the most deprived and marginalized children who suffer the most. According to a modeling done by Johns Hopkins University, scaling up pneumonia treatment and prevention services could have saved the lives of 3.2 million children under the age of five and create a ripple effect that could prevent 5.7 million extra child deaths from other major childhood diseases. And we want to welcome a number of new colleagues today. The UN Development Coordination Office tells us we have new resident coordinators in Bolivia, Congo, Tanzania, and Thailand. These appointments follow confirmation from their respective governments. Uh, Susana Sotoli of Argentina will serve as resident coordinator in Bolivia. Chris Mburu of Kenya will serve in the Republic of the Congo. Zlatan Milicic of Bosnia and Herzegovina will serve in Tanzania. And Gita Sabarawal of India will be the new resident coordinator in Thailand. Resident coordinators seek to boost the development coordination among UN agencies, funds, and programs, which, as you know, will be crucial to support countries as we enter the decade of action to achieve the sustainable development goals. We're also proud to announce that we will remain fully gender parity along, among all our resident coordinators, covering 162 countries and territories. We have the full biographies in our office uh, where you'll f and also on the SDG website. Sherwin. Thanks, Steph. Uh, following your note to correspondence yesterday on the Middle East, mm -hmm. this news headline, quote, UN rejects deal of the century. Is that an accurate reflection of your position? Uh, listen, I, I'm not in the business of, uh, of analyzing headlines. I think the the words that we used in the um, in the note to correspondence was very uh, clear that we'd seen uh, the announcement, and the position of the UN uh, on the two state solution has been defined throughout the years by relevant Security Council and General Assembly resolutions, by which the Secretariat is bound. So there are calls from the likes of organizations like Human Rights Watch for a rethink of the peace process, does the United States still enjoy the full confidence of the Secretary General as the chief lead mediator in this conflict? Look, uh, the United States uh, remains a critical uh, actor in uh, the Middle East peace process. Our, um, our work is, and our, we are, our work is defined and led by the Security Council. We have been given mandates and there are resolutions of the General Assembly and the Security Council, and we are bound by that. i just make a final point. For uh, years, UN officials, Steph, have talked about this window of opportunity closing uh, for a two-state solution. How does this plan, produced by the White House yesterday, affect the trajectory and the speed of that closing window? I would uh, leave that to your, that analysis to you. Maria. Thank you. Follow up on the resolutions you just mentioned. They are mentioned as well in 
uh, this uh, presented yesterday peace plan and in very detailed analysis of United Nations efforts in two paragraphs. Uh, it says that General Assembly and Security Council resolutions on this topic uh, are have not and will not resolve the conflict. Have you do you have any comments particular? I, you know, on I, this I'm, part? I'm going to I think disappoint uh, most of you, um, and that just say that you know where this Antonio Guterres is the Secretary General of the United Nations, right? His the work of the Secretariat, his work is bound by those resolutions passed by member states. Uh, Big and then James. Thank you, Staff. We have been hearing that the report by the Board of Inquiry investigating uh, hospital bombings in Idlib has been delayed until March. Can you confirm that? And can you also give us a sense of uh, why the report has been delayed? Uh, when we hear uh, UN Humanitarian Chief Mark Lowcock speaking at the Security Council and talking about hundreds of uh, bombings in southern Idlib by the government of Syria and its allies openly. And uh, why has the report been delayed? Sure. The, the report uh, has indeed been uh, the, the, the deadline of the, of the report uh, has been uh, extended. The board is now expected to complete its work and submit a report to the Secretary General by March 13th. Uh, this was done at the request of the board. I can't speak for them. I mean, they are investigating and looking into incidents. They felt they needed more time, and uh, the secretary general felt it was just right. It was just it was appropriate uh, to grant them that extra time. Mr. Bays. So back to your note to correspondence um, with regard to the U.S. plan. There seems to be something missing from the statement. The Secretary General has seen the plan and then the Secretary General lays out the UN's previous mm -hmm. position which he says is defined by relevant Security Council and General Assembly resolutions. Does the Secretary General believe that the plan unveiled by President Trump is consistent with relevant Security Council and General Assembly resolutions? Look, uh We've seen the announcement of the plan. Uh, I'm not going to get into that, which will be left to to others to to decide, notably member states uh, themselves. Um, for us, there are parameters that bind us, uh, and we need to keep within those parameters. But surely, if he doesn't pronounce <coughs> on that absolutely central issue, then his words become weak. In fact, pretty pointless. No, I don't think they are pointless. They are a reminder of his position. One final question on yeah. this. Does the Secretary General, now he's read it and absorbed it, does he think this is a peace plan or an annexation uh, plan? Uh, I'm not going to characterize it. Uh, the Secretary General did, in fact, receive a call from uh, Mr. Kushner yesterday afternoon who briefed him uh, on the plan, but I'm not going to go further than what I've said. Uh, Joe, I'll get to you. Yes, um, I don't want to get into the characterization of the plan either. Um, but one of the principles I believe the Secretary General has repeatedly enunciated, and it's in the Security Council resolutions as well, is the importance of direct negotiations between the Israelis and the Palestinians. So however you want to characterize this plan, it lays out uh, one marker, uh, one perspective on resolving uh, the conflict, contiguous uh, boundaries, freeze on settlements for four years, recognizing the Palestinian capital and the portion of eastern uh, Jerusalem, et cetera. Would the Secretary General at least be uh, open to direct negotiations based on the Palestinians' definition of what the appropriate border should be? And this plan, even if you don't... I think we're, we're, we're diving into weeds in which I have no interest in going into. Well, it's a question... But, uh, but let, let me finish, my, let okay, me finish my, my, my answer. I think if you look at uh, and you reread the voluminous number of briefings we have provided to the Security Council, 
on this issue. You will find one thing that comes up in, again and again is the call for uh, direct talks uh, with the parties. We, as I said yesterday, we continue to be committed uh, to supporting Palestinians and Israelis to resolve uh, the conflict on basis of, of the resolutions. But would, let me follow up, would the Secretary General see this, this enunciated position, however you want to characterize it, plan, uh, put out and endorsed by Israel, with some compromises by Israel, as one poll in direct negotiations and encouraging the Palestinians at least to enter into negotiations, not accept it, but enter into negotiations with their own position we, we, and we try have, to find a middle ground. I, I, I don't want to have to repeat what I've just said, so I won't. Uh, Evelyn. Further on the same issue. Um, Secretary Generals for the two-state solution. The new plan does have two states. I won't characterize what kind of states they are, uh, but uh, would that, is that Look, something? Uh, we, we have laid out in our uh, words yesterday our position. You can all do a compare and contrast exercise. Madame. <laughs> Welcome back. Thank you. As you may have seen, there's an AP story today about a uh, hack of various. There is indeed UN an AP story out today. <laughs> about some UN computers in yeah. the offices in Geneva and Vienna. What do you know about that, and particularly about who might have done it and what they got? All right. What, uh, what the story refers to are attacks that took place in uh, the middle of last year. Uh, the damage related to the specific attack has been contained, and additional mitigation measures uh, implemented. You know, the, the UN is no different from any organization or individuals. Uh, the threat of future attacks continues, uh, and the UN, uh, our, our colleagues at Secretariat, detect and respond to multiple attacks at various levels of sophistication on a daily basis. Uh, this particular attack that uh, your colleagues report on is not a, a, a landmark uh, event. Uh, these things, uh, attempts to uh, attack the UN uh, IT infrastructure happen uh, often. You know, the, the attribution of, a, um, of any uh, IT attack is, remains very fuzzy and uncertain, uh, so we are not able to pinpoint to any specific uh, potential uh, attacker, but it was, from all accounts, uh, a well-resourced uh, attack. James. So Sorry, some, and then I'll, I'll go to some, So some follow-ups. Yeah. First on that, uh, on the report of this hack by AP, but first by the new humanitarian to give credit where credit that's is due. Sure. That's your uh, job. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but why did the UN <coughs> cover up this attack, given that it was a hack on computers that carried sensitive humanitarian and human rights data, data that might involve partner organizations and aid agencies. Okay. Didn't they need it, to it know that I you'd been hacked? There, there was not, as I said, we, we, we are under constant, like anyone, you know, their attempts are made regularly. Um, the the just server in Geneva that you're referring to was part of a development environment and contained non-sensitive test data from two development servers uh, used for, for web application. Uh, people who needed to be notified uh, were notified. I have another couple of follow-ups. Can I do them? Now? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, so um, further, it's, uh, we're going on from the plan that was announced. There are reports that Israel is contemplating annexation mm -hmm. of settlements, possibly as early as this weekend. What is the message of the Secretary General to the government of Israel on the possibility of annexing parts Look, of the West we, Bank? We have, we, these reports have come up uh, before. Uh, we have always stood against any uh, unilateral, uh, unilateral actions. And uh, Mr. Mladenov himself has said it repeatedly. And my last follow-up is, as, as you know, we're expecting the next meeting, as you've discussed, of the WHO Executive mm -hmm. Committee in the coming hours. Um, I just want to ask, 
about the readiness of the entire UN system, mm -hmm. and also if they were to go to the global emergency designation, what would it mean for the UN system? Uh, you know, we are uh, on on our. Um, uh, sorry, hold on a second. Let me just look for something. On our end, our health uh, our health service is obviously very much aware of the situation. There's been updated guidance uh, put on on the internet uh, for basic uh, basic precautions that people have uh, have to take. Obviously, let's see what WHO uh, deals with. They are our voice on this within uh, the UN system, and we will obviously follow their directives uh, very closely. Masood, you've been very patient. Yeah, yeah. And then we'll go to yeah, I know. this side of the room. I know your attention was diverted. I can imagine. <laughs> yes, sir. I, my question is also about Middle East. I'll follow up to question by James and Mr. Klein. Now, basically, it seems as though the Middle East peace process, as we know it, is dead. Israel is ready to annex uh, the, the uh, territories, and it has said so. Uh, especially uh, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said it as, as yesterday also. So now my question is, is what is it that the Secretary General can do? What is it that he can do to what he call bring about some sort of a semblance of settlement if, it, if at all? And will that be possible during his lifetime? During the lifetime of the Secretary, Secretary General? General? Yes, I hope he lives a long time. Yes, so yes. Yeah. During the while he is the secretary general. Uh, sorry, um, uh, let me refocus here. Um, listen uh, again. I, I I sound like a like a broken mm -hmm. record. If not that records exist anymore, um, we have expressed our position over and over again in in the Security Council. Uh, we have a special coordinator uh, on the ground who is doing whatever he can. Um, and we've expressed our concern uh, at uh, the appearance of moving away from uh, a two-state solution. I mean, Mr. Mladenov and, and others have said it in, in the Security Council. So I would just refer you back to what we've, we've already said. I, I outlined what our basic uh, and I think firm principles are. So, so given the fact that you keep on saying that it's going to be a, it's a broken record, but the fact remains this situation is such that it it will keep on happening again and again. And now, I mean, I suspect or I fear that there will be massive protests, protests especially in Gaza and West Bank. What is it, and the Secretary General? What is it that the Secretary General can do to avoid them or to bring the, about the Secretary some sort of General service? and the Secretariat have voiced their uh, their position and are, will never rest in working with the Israelis and uh, and Palestinians in supporting them in tr in trying to find a solution based on the relevant resolutions. Okay. I, 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 you know, I'm uh, Masood. With all due respect, I'm happy to moderate a discussion between you and Joe and looking at the the situation on on the ground. But I, I think I've I've run out of words uh, here. Yes, sir. And then uh, we'll go. Good afternoon, Stefan. Let us shift gears and go on to Africa. I have two questions regarding Africa. The first is in Sahel, and the second will be on the uh, upcoming elections in Cote d'Ivoire, November 2020. So regarding the Sahel. Madam Florence Parley, the French Minister of Defense, was in the U.S. this week. She had a visit with the Secretary of Defense, and she expressed concerns regarding potential uh, reduction of military support by the U.S. in the troubled Sahel, West Africa. There's about 500 soldiers in Niger. So does the uh, Secretary General share the um, concerns of Madam Parley? Regarding this. Look, uh, the Secretary General has been very clear is that he believes the international community uh, should step up its effort and do whatever they can to support the countries on the front line, namely the G5 Sahel uh, forces with uh, robust and predictable uh, support for their military anti-terrorist action, and at the same time uh, also provide support for a number of the development uh, aspects uh, to address some of the root causes of what we're seeing. 
Part of that is also what is going on in Libya. And that's no secret of the impact of the continued conflict in Libya on the precarious situation in Western Africa. Okay, the second part was um, Cote d'Ivoire. Um, Guillaume Soro, uh, he was a former rebel, former president of the Cote d'Ivoire National Assembly. He's in Paris. So he announced this week that he's going to be a candidate in the upcoming elections in Cote d'Ivoire. And um, he says he's been railroaded. There's an arrest warrant for his, um, there's a warrant for his arrest. He claims it's on trumped up charges. Uh, regarding the United Nations, he says his lawyer has um, placed a request I, with the United Nations to assure that his rights will be respected concerning this. I, I will try to get, I have not, nothing on Cote d'Ivoire, but I'll try to get you something. Uh, David. Oh, when, yeah. Thanks. Um, just to follow up on the Board of Inquiry, um, what format will, will the conclusions of the Board, just if you have an update on what format the conclusions will be presented in, uh, will I mean, be they'll a, be presented in written form to the, to the Secretary well, But will it be a full report or a summary? And, a, a full uh, report will go to the Secretary General, and then he will assess the next steps. Have you, have you, has he made any decisions about no, it? No, I think he has to see the full report first. And is there any possibility that he'll be, make it public at that point? There's a possibility of a lot of things happening within his lifetime, as Masood would say. Yes, sir. If there was any word on the kind of malware or the vector used in the hack? No, nothing that I'm going to, that I'm able to share with you, mostly because I don't know. But obviously, uh, I think our, our IT uh, folks are constantly focused on uh, the attempts uh, that have happened almost on a daily basis uh, to penetrate uh, the systems here. Like, you know, again, it's like any other organization or like individuals or news organizations, it's always about trying to stay uh, one step ahead. And it's about ensuring that you learn from every, uh, from every incident um, and you heighten the, the impact of protecting yourself. And also, it's also on to, I mean, like, like any of us, it's also the responsibility. It's important that individuals uh, follow the proper uh, IT hygiene, to put it that way. Um, all the way in the back, and then Carla. Go ahead. Thank you, Steph. Um, just a quick follow-up on James' questions about the readiness of the UN with the coronavirus. Um, we can see here at the headquarters a lot of Chinese groups coming every day. Do we know exactly how many are they for a week time, for example? Look, and do you, did you start monitoring or some, did you put anything for, in place? First of all, I think it is very dangerous to start targeting certain uh, people for the way, A, for the way they will look or for where we think they, they, they come from. And I, I, I know you didn't mean it that way, but I just, that's, I think it's a very important message uh, to, to put out. Um, there are screenings being done, as we understand it, in our host country at uh, various airports, so it's the responsibility of the, uh, of the host uh, country. We have no travel restrictions on UN staff at this time, uh, but obviously, as I told James, prevent, whatever preventive measures we can all take from just washing your hands uh, are being communicated uh, very actively and proactively uh, to staff of the United Nations. Carla. Questions. Um, many years ago, was it five or six maybe, when Richard Falk, Professor Richard Falk, Professor of International Law, was Special Rapporteur on the situation in the Palestinian, the occupied territories, he said the chances of a two-state solution are growing more and more unlikely uh, given the expansion of the settlements. From a realistic point of view, how much territory is left and is this a lost cause? Uh, we, we, don't, we don't believe that causes are lost. Uh, as far as the numbers of, of settlements and territory, uh, I think that research is publicly available. I don't have those numbers. What is your second question, Carla? This, <clears throat> there were reports that the risks of the coronavirus were exaggerated. I don't know if they came from the WHO, but I know they were credible sources. Do you know anything about that? No, I mean, they are, my only source mm -hmm. is the WHO, as it should be. 
uh, Masood, and then Big Tool, and then James. Thank you, uh, Stefan. Now, about uh, this, I mean, despite the fact uh, they've been disappointed several times, the Kashmiri women and girls holding vigil in a place called Shaheen Bagh in Kashmir are still hoping that somehow United Nations will bring some sort of semblance of understanding between the India and, and the Kashmiris so that they are released and so that they have their rights. They are still being denied their right to internet or their right to move around. So what is it that the Secretary General, or for that matter, the, his human rights, uh, what you call well, commissioner? I think the, the High Commissioner for Human Rights has uh, spoken out on, on Kashmir, and I would refer you to what uh, she said. As for us, I think I've, I, I don't want to give you the same answer I gave you last week, but that's where we are. But uh, these boys and girls, uh, well, we, we, we are, we are, you know, I, I think it's been, uh, it's been, very clear for us that uh, the final settlement of the dispute uh, concerning Jammu and Kashmir uh, needs to be reached by peaceful means in accordance with the charter and with the full uh, respect for human rights. Big Tool, then James, then Maria. On Libya's we'll staff, uh, we were expecting the five plus one, uh, five plus five military. A commission to convene in Geneva yesterday. It didn't happen. Is it going to happen? If yes, when, that is, when is it going to happen? I don't have an update uh, for you on that. When we have confirmation, I will share that with you. My question was just asked. Excellent. Good job. Maria, let's see if you can ask a question that has yet to be asked or answered. Uh, my question was asked actually today at Security <laughs> Council, but it wasn't answered because Mr. Lowcock um, right. uh, left earlier, so probably he could answer it instead of him about the numbers uh, you get from Syria and uh, the, for example, 81 mm, civilians killed during one week in, mm -hmm. in this month. Uh, where did you get these numbers? Uh, are they, uh, because like there is no monitoring mission uh, from UN in Idlib, other NGO or other organizations which uh, well, provide I mean, you with so information? Some of the numbers, I think, have been put out by the High Commissioner for, for Human Rights. It is always challenging, obviously, to put those numbers together. Uh, they do it from uh, sources that we deem uh, credible and reliable. Uh, but I think I would look at, at the, the statements that they've put out where, you know, on January 21st, <coughs> eight civilians were reportedly killed. There have been other reported airstrikes. Um, but we have no reason to doubt uh, the numbers that they're using. Okay, Joe, and then in the back. Yeah. Just as a follow-up to that, um, we heard this morning the um, severe humanitarian crisis uh, Lack, lack of medical supplies because of um, the closing of, of at least two of the uh, border crossings. Uh, we also heard that the Secretary General is supposed to report by the end of February, I believe they said, mm -hmm. uh, on alternatives. Now, given the urgency, again, that we heard this morning about the medical crisis and the impact of the closings on that crisis, uh, is the Secretary General going to uh, move up uh, his report on alternatives to match well, I mean, the urgency? We're, we're, we're working as, as uh, quickly as, as we can to come up with uh, you know, feasible, uh, feasible options. Uh, I think our colleagues on the ground are working in very difficult conditions to try to get aid uh, to those who need it through uh, cross-border or as Mr. Uh, Lowcock said, trying, attempting through some of the cross lines, which has proven uh, very challenging. Yes, sir, we'll give you the last question. Thank you. On coronavirus, what's the Secretary General's uh, opinion on the measures that the Chinese government so far has taken to prevent further spread of the I, I think virus? Uh, the Secretary General is full agreement with uh, Dr. Tedros, the head of WHO, on China's uh, on on, on being supportive of what China has done to date to contain the virus. Thank you. Ooh, that was long.